Hi, it's Krista at UT Southwestern. Today is World Mental Health Day and I'm super excited to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Hughes with the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care here at UT Southwestern. Yeah. So welcome to our chat. Thank you. Glad she's here. So I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Hughes. So she serves as head of the Risk and Resilience Network here at the Center for Depression and Clinical Care. And her research is fascinating. She really explores the efficacy and effectiveness of psychosocial treatments for building resilience, as well as the prevention and treatment of youth depression. So I think this should be a really great chat. Definitely resilience is in the news a lot. Yeah. It seems everybody's talking about it. And just to get started, yeah. How do you define resilience? Yeah. What is it? Yeah, I think that's a great question to start with. So resilience is really that ability to bounce back from stress. Okay. So to go through some kind of a life adversity and not only to come out of that adversity doing okay, but to maybe even be stronger than you were before. So um, we were talking a little bit earlier about this relationship between stress and resilience. And you do need some life stress to build resilience but then how you deal with that stress is the process of resilience. And so it's kind of a chicken or the egg question, which comes first. <laughs> stress, resilience, those are very interrelated. Gotcha. And you know, can you give us a, maybe a brief example of what that looks like, what resiliency, how it works? Yeah, so um, our earliest understanding of resilience actually comes out of the 1970s. So um, Dr. Emmy Warner studied a group of kids in Hawaii. And they were really trying to understand these were kids who came from a pretty tough background. They came from places of poverty and they had parents who had um, mental illness or who had um, struggles with alcoholism. And what they noticed was about two thirds of the kids went on through their teenage years and really struggled. They themselves either struggled with mental illness or struggled with substance use or just kind of risky teen behavior. And then there was a third of the kids who really through their teenage years did really well. And so she termed that coin, or coined the term resilience to explain that little group of the third that went on to do well. Um, as you look over the resilience literature since the 70s, most of the early work focuses on understanding the building of resilience in kids who had a tough background. What we're interested in here at the center is understanding what does resilience look like in kids, mm -hmm. that same kind of kid, but also how do you build resilience in your kid that just kind of has a normal background? Mm -hmm. You know, I hate the word normal as a psychologist, but you know, an mm -hmm. average, that, mm -hmm. the sort of average kiddo who maybe doesn't have those same kind of parent stressors or poverty, poverty stressors, gotcha. what will resilience look like in that? So um, we do have a study right now at UT Southwestern where okay. we are looking at resilience in 10 to 24 year olds. It's okay. called the RAB study, Resilience in Adolescent Development. And we're following a group of people for 10 years to understand some of the biomarkers and stressors related to the building of resilience, but also the prevention of depression and anxiety. Okay, and we're gonna share some information about the RAD awesome. study, is yeah. that what it's called, the RAD, RAD study? Yeah. Here in our chat, we'll put that along, so if anybody's interested, you can join, and I'm sure we'll get some questions about it later. You know, if you have questions, be sure to submit them in the feed. We're gonna take as many as we can get to in the 30 minutes, and they're already coming in, so thank you. Awesome. So here's one we have from Jenny, and this is actually a question similar to mine, and it's how do we create or reinforce resilience in children who face so many negatives? And we're talking about big ones, you know, suicides in our community, natural disasters, as well as more personal ones, such as negative body image or mean kids. Yeah. You know, what do you think what about, do that? about that? Yeah, so resilience itself is made up of a bunch of different factors, and it's really a dynamic process. I think of the building of resilience in kids as being a dynamic thing. Mm -hmm. You're not just born with a set amount of resilience and that's all you got. So um, we know that there's individual factors related to resilience, so temperament, self-efficacy, social skills, adaptive coping skills, and then we know there's some environmental factors, so things like strong family relationships, strong social relationships, having that place you feel like you fit in, whether it's school or your job or those kinds of things. And so I do think it feels like our kids are bombarded with stress right now. I think adults are too, but, um, but I also think um, some of that is good. I mean, resilience is forged in the fire of stress. And so um, to parents, I would say really talking about these stresses with your kids. And in particular, um, when your child tries something and they mm -hmm. fail at it, or they're not very good at it, or they see a friend fail at something, talking about what was learned from that failure. 
failures become such a weird word in our society. We, we like to avoid it, we don't like to feel it, we don't like to do it, but it's actually really important for um, stretching yourself and stretching the brain. We know that brain plasticity is a thing, we know the brain is malleable and changeable over time, and so that having this, they call it growth mindset. Gotcha. If you've ever heard of Carol Dweck's work, she's a psychologist that coined this term of the idea that um, you can learn over time, you can mm -hmm. learn and change over time, and having the mindset that you can do that makes a really big difference when you encounter something that's really stressful or a failure. Right, so great question there, Jenny. Here's a different one from, from Corey, and I think you may know Corey, but <laughs> you know, how can we help break the stigmas and myths surrounding mental health? Is re resilience a part of that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, conversations like this, where we talk about some of the more sort of um, positive or strength building aspects of mental health. Mm -hmm. Mental health is a big topic, right? And I think in yeah. our culture, we tend to think of mental health as being mental illness. Mm -hmm. And that, that really is where psychiatry and psychology have focused a lot of their time, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think continuing conversations about mental illness and how we can support people and create better treatments and better mm -hmm. ways of recognizing illness is step one, of mm -hmm. course. But I think we also have learned we need to pay attention to the other part of mental health, which is mental wellness and resiliency, and have more conversations and programs that educate about some of what the field of positive psychology has learned, how people can become happier, more effective, how they can build up their coping resources. All right, so that, that leads into perfect into the next question, is we've talked you know, about what resilience is, you know that it's important, that it deals with adversity, and that you, you can't get through life without it. How does somebody build up their resilience? I mean, what are some practices or things that people can do? Yeah, um, so number one, I would say try new things. <laughs> Ex expose yourself to some challenges. Um, and, and then after you've been challenged, think and talk about what that meant for you. So mm -hmm. how did I experience that? What kind of feelings did it bring up? What parts mm -hmm. of it made me feel successful? And what parts of it made me feel like I failed? And then how did I deal with those parts? Right? Mm -hmm. Being resilient doesn't mean that you never experience negative emotions. Okay. It just means that you learn how to notice those in yourself and maybe mm -hmm. you learn how to tolerate them or maybe you learn how to use some coping skills to get through it. Okay. And coping skills can be internal things like soothing yourself or kind of mm -hmm. having your go-to way you take care of yourself like through exercise or sleeping better or making sure you're eating okay. Mm -hmm. um, but coping can also be me reaching out to people that you know care for you. So knowing who your friends are, knowing who in your family you feel the closest to, and really um, kind of finding the places where you know you need extra support mm -hmm. and being willing to go towards that support. Gotcha, so it's, it's not, it doesn't sound like there's a one size fits all, you can improve your resiliency by doing yoga or right. by exercising. Right, it's more the process of going, when you go through a stress, either because you challenge yourself or because mm -hmm. a stress just kind of happened to you. Sure. Really taking the time to reflect upon that and what you learned from it mm -hmm. and to take note of doing more of the things that felt effective for you mm -hmm. and then maybe doing less of the things that didn't and mm -hmm. figuring out where you may have some areas of weakness or deficit where you need to learn some new skills or you need to find some more support and, and really going toward that. Okay, good to know. It's a really great question. So what about, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of Adolescents. At what age should parents really start kind of working with their kids to make sure that they do have some resilience? Yeah, yeah. So I, I always say I, I think the job of a parent is so challenging. One, because you're not giving a handbook, <laughs> and two, the role is ever changing, right? So mm -hmm. when you're when your little one is a baby or a toddler, right, you really are wanting to set up the world for them, and you're yeah. solving problems for them, and all those things because they're just not able to do it yet, right? Mm -hmm. But as their brain develops and as they grow. Um, that role of a parent changes, right? Mm -hmm. You're wanting them to have some more autonomy, especially in the teenage years, and mm -hmm. you're wanting them to learn to um, identify problems and obstacles and to try to figure out how they're gonna deal with that. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sure you've heard the term helicopter parenting. Yes, I have. I'm sure people have heard. The new one actually I heard was curling parenting, you know that Olympic sport where the, yeah, the where person goes out in front and they scrub the ice furiously so that wow. the person has a smooth ride. That's another another thing we're seeing. So um, I, I think what we actually know from the research is uh, it really does a huge disservice if you protect your child from all stress. Okay. Because a little bit of adversity and stress is needed to kind of forge this resilience. 
there's a really great study um, by Dr. Siri Holman and Cohen Silver called Whatever Does Not Kill Us, <laughs> Cumulative Life Adversity, Vulnerability, and Resilience. And right. the thing about this study that's so interesting, they studied a large group of adults okay. and they asked them to sort of categorize the amount of life, life adversity that they had had over time. And not surprisingly, they found that people with really high life adversity mm -hmm. reported a lower quality of life because th things were just too much. It was overload, right? right. But also, the group that reported very little life adversity mm -hmm. reported a lower quality of life and resiliency. Interesting. Which sort of goes against what we would think, right? We're kind of right. like, oh, if we protect people and, and keep them out of stress and adversity, maybe that will make them happier. And actually, right. they found the happiest group that was the most resilient were some that were in the middle. They kind of had this middle amount of life adversity. So I say my career is about helping parents find that kind of middle amount, what that actually means, right. <laughs> so that we can have sort of a number or a metric to understand the kinds of stresses and the amounts of stress that we want kids to be exposed to a bit. Gotcha. I would not have expected that it, finding yes, either. Yes, it was a very strange curvilinear effect, but, oh. but I think it, it's very telling, and, and I think that's why I go around kind of preaching that we need to be really thoughtful about this approach of helicopter parenting, because I worry we're going to end up with kids who have had very little life adversity, and that might then result in kids who are less resilient because they haven't had the chance for that to form out. Yeah. So, great question. Here's one we have from Raymond, yeah. and his question is, is resilience genetic, and can it be inherited? Okay, yeah, so um, that is what we are working on studying here right now. I love that question. So um, we definitely know there are some mechanisms that have a biological basis that relate to resilience. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, we know that there's some neuropeptides in the brain that are really known to kind of limit the stress response when mm -hmm. cortisol gets too high okay. in a hope of kind of protecting the body from the effects of that cortisol. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that you could see how that would map onto resilience, right? The stress mm -hmm. response and how that works in the body. So certainly there's pieces of resilience that have a biological basis, mm -hmm. um, but I think there's also pieces that are learned and pieces that we can adapt. And so um, part of that RAD study, the mm -hmm. goal is to really understand more of the biology behind resilience, but also to understand which parts of that biology can still be malleable so that mm -hmm. we can build some programs into places like schools, families, um, mm -hmm. you know, some, some different activities and programs where people can work to build resilience, mm -hmm. even if somebody kind of comes to the table with a biology that's maybe not so attuned yeah. to that. So is there a role then for, you know, parents and other adults, maybe people that interact with kids at schools or whatever location that be for them to model Resilience? Is that a yeah. good thing? Yeah. Oh, I think that's fantastic. And and um, I spend a lot of times at schools talking to parents about this very idea and teachers. Um, I think it's really modeling that, that growth mindset, as I mentioned earlier, that idea that um, failure is really an opportunity to learn something and to, to stretch and to build that sort of resilience muscle, if we're to call it that. And so having parents and teachers be willing to reflect upon challenges mm -hmm. and to reflect upon their process of handling a challenge. I think so many times we try to not let our kids see our worries or see our stressors because we just want to, you know, that, yeah. that seems like a bad idea. But I think there's certain stressors our kids would benefit from us talking about how we dealt with them. Good to know. So that's a good, good tie into this next question. This one's from Carter. Do you think it's important to talk about mental illness or mental health in the workplace? And what's the best way to do that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I, I think there is a growing awareness um, mm -hmm. in the workplace that this is an important topic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of workplaces have like employee support programs um, where people can get counseling sessions if they need it. EAPs, I believe is what they're called. Um, I, I think it, it's still, I hate to give a blanket answer because I don't know your workplace, Carter, and, and I think there's certain workplaces that are more open to talking about these things than others. Mm -hmm. But again, I think this is where us thinking about the wide range of what mental health means, mm -hmm. maybe a place to introduce these topics into your workplace has to do with more on that end of mental health and mental wellness and talking about resilience and how we manage stress and some of these ideas, and then hopefully getting the workplace comfortable talking about that would right. lead to a workplace that's also comfortable talking about mental illness. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I know we're starting to do a lot of that here. We've got a question from Joe, and the question is, can prevention, psychoeducation, or interventions teach resilience? perhaps even at school-based levels. Yeah, yeah. So that is something we're also doing here at the center. So yes, I, I love that question. Yes, so um, we actually are working with local Dallas area schools. We're at about 27 high school and middle schools now, um, doing a program that is intended to do just that. 
So our program is called Youth Aware of Mental Health, and it's a mental health promotion program that really builds in kind of two major pieces. So one is mental health literacy, mm -hmm. basically giving teens a common language to talk about mental health, to talk about mm -hmm. coping skills, to talk about stress management, depression, signs of suicide, and then how to help a friend in need. The other major part of the program gives them ways to practice that. So oh. they get to role play and they mm -hmm. get to really try to play with this material some. And through that role play and the discussions about how you would help a friend who's having a hard time, mm -hmm. um, it builds perspective taking, mm -hmm. this, which builds empathy. We know both of those things are very related to resilience. So um, excitingly, this is a program that was originally developed and tested in Europe and shown to have impact on reducing youth suicide. That was why we selected to use it here, but we are also now studying its impact on resilience. So I hope to have more data for that soon. That's so fascinating. So yeah. is the plan to, to roll that out to additional schools in North Texas? Yeah, so we're currently um, accepting interest from mm -hmm. local schools. Right. And, um, but yeah, it's been a great program. We're going into our third academic year mm -hmm. and um, it has grown over time. We definitely have schools that are interested, but um, I think what makes it unique UT Southwestern doing this program is mm -hmm. that we really not only are helping roll out a new program in schools, but it's mm -hmm. a program that has some evidence and we're continuing to study the evidence. I think that's so important that as we help disseminate programs in the community, we make sure that we continue to test if those are helpful towards the things we would like them to impact. Absolutely. So here's a question that's focused really on healthcare providers, but the question is how and why is it important for healthcare providers to be resilient? Oh. Yeah. Seems like that's that's a given with what healthcare providers yeah. deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, um, we're fortunate here at UT Southwestern. I can speak to that answer very easily. So um, our medical school has a really great wellness clinic and a wellness program where they're focusing on teaching medical students and residents things like mindfulness practice, mm -hmm. um, where they're giving them resources to have access to mental health providers if they mm -hmm. need that during that very stressful time of medical school and residency. <laughs> um, so I, I personally think that that change starts at the level of education. And if we can get our healthcare providers as they learn to do healthcare, how to take care of themselves as well, and how to notice when they are feeling distressed and how to know to reach out for resources, then they will sort of grow into and develop into healthcare providers that do the same. Um, there's definitely a lot of evidence out there that healthcare providers um, are at particular risk for um, things like depression and um, even even increased risk for suicide because um, of all the different stresses in that field. And so, um, yeah, I think resilience, they're probably poised to be some of our most resilient people due to the amount of stress they encounter. And the hope is that we can build some of the skills that they need early on in their training so that they can um, continue to help everybody feel better but make themselves, you know, taken care of as well. That's a really important component. Yeah. So here's a question from Christina. And this is getting back to kind of the parent of resilience. When should I talk to my kids about the importance of mental health? Mm, yeah, I, I think I, I would be on the bias side as a child psychologist of saying start early and often. But, yeah. um, but I think setting up a home culture where you do reflect upon how you're feeling, where you talk about your mood, um, where you check in at the dinner table about what were you know sort of the best parts of your day and what were the challenges of your day and mm -hmm. and maybe what made that challenging starts to set the tone for this idea that that feelings don't just come out of nowhere and that um, thoughts and feelings and behaviors are very related to one another and so if something happens to you of course you have a feeling in response to that and probably you did something in response to that and how did that go for you how did that work for you so starting those conversations at a very sort of simple straightforward level can happen as young as preschool right and then it sets the tone hopefully for having a language that your family uses to talk about things like stress and wellness and over time, if mental illness is something that needs to be addressed, you've already talked about these things, so that maybe doesn't feel so scary or out of the blue. So that ties in well with this next question from Dan. And how can we, talked a lot about little kids, his question is how can we teach, teach teenagers to be more resilient? Yeah, yeah, so um, I think one big piece is just having social emotional learning programs in our schools. Um, more and more we're recognizing that um, having some time for our students to reflect about the importance of feelings and relationships mm -hmm at school actually has academic impact. Um, some of these programs, are, there's only really five for high schools that have an evidence base behind them, but mm -hmm. it demonstrates that if you spend some time addressing these things in the classroom setting, mm -hmm. better graduation rates, 
people are passing school more. So um, schools are making, they're noticing this and they're making some time to really approach the whole student. So um, I think it's making sure with teens that um, across domains, both at home and at school, we are reflecting together and having a common language to talk about these challenges that come up, to talk about stress, to talk about mood, um, doing education programs like the Youth Aware of Mental Health mm -hmm. program that we're doing. Um, but then again, in the home, being sure that you have time where you have conversations with your teens about the ways that they're feeling, the kinds of stressors they're encountering, and how they're making sense mm -hmm. of their response to the stress. And if it feels like they're growing, learning, feeling effective and responding to challenges because all of those kinds of feelings about yourself build resilience. So you mentioned that, you know, these conversations, you know, I hear lots of stories about, you know, my teen won't answer questions, my kid won't talk to me without, do you have a, suggestions for questions to kind of coax them to yeah. give you information yeah. or to, to have a conversation with you? Yeah, so um, this is why I say start early <laughs> because if you've developed a, a relationship with your team like that from early mm -hmm. on where just talking about challenges is something you do, mm -hmm. then that becomes kind of what you do, right? But I think if you have a teen who maybe is a little more difficult to engage, I always say do something together. Get out there and do an activity. Um, I, I teach a bit about family wellness, and we definitely know that families that experience new, exciting, challenging things together mm -hmm. report feeling closer to one another. So um, there, there's actually some great data in the couples literature that um, continuing to like date your partner, right, mm -hmm. if you've been married for 30 years, actually increases your feelings of love and intimacy towards them. Because mm -hmm. when you try new challenges, there's this like rush of adrenaline that yeah. happens, right? that feels kind of like what falling in love feels like. So the same thing applies to families. If you're doing a new thing together, if you're all taking a cheese making class, or you're, you know, going to the park and playing some game together that you've never all played before, mm -hmm. um, that brings up these adrenaline rushes. And even if it goes poorly, that brings up adrenaline rush, right? And then you have something to talk about. You have something to laugh about. You have something to reflect on. Um, so sometimes the surliest of teenagers will be willing to suggest a family activity that's mm -hmm. something they've always wanted to do. You just have to be willing to roll with it, and it might take you out of your comfort zone. But um, but that can be one nice way to start some of these kinds of conversations because that gives you a natural place to reflect on what the challenge was there since you were all trying something new, to reflect on what you liked about it, what you didn't like, how you faced that challenge when it happened to you. You know, Did you quit? Did you keep going? What helped you keep going? Those kinds of talks. We are, we are about five minutes left in our chat. I just want to put this out there that we're running out of time for questions. These have all been great. Definitely keep them coming. So, you know, when we talked about, you we're just talking about teens. I mean, there are also, teens aren't the only ones that can be kind of to themselves and introverted or difficult. I mean, what about like the young child that's maybe first entering school is just very quiet. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you really get that person to, that child to open up? Yeah, well, um, certainly there's different levels of quiet, and um, if, it, if it's to the point where a child's, you know, not willing to speak at all outside the home, then I would recommend seeing a child psychologist. There's things that can be done to help um, kids that are struggling with that. Mm -hmm. But I think if you have a child who's just more prone to be an introvert, or mm -hmm. maybe likes to do sort of solo activities a bit, um, ways to engage them in talking about resilience would be just to focus on something they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So if you have a young child who's kind of quiet but they're a reader, maybe go to the library and have them pick a new book that's very different from what they would normally read. Maybe, you know, like if they are not a sporty kid, have them read a sports book. And then just talk to them, like, what was that like? Did you finish it? Did you like it? What, you know, was it boring? Yeah, just, just engaging them in conversations about challenges within the context of the way they like to spend their time. Obviously, over time, you want to encourage some social development and friendships, but even introverts like social relationships. Mm -hmm. It's just they might approach it in a slightly different way. And so, um, again, providing your child with opportunities to, mm -hmm. to kind of be outside the box a little bit, but you might ease into that by starting in areas that are interesting to them. Gotcha. Okay, great question. So here's one from Christina, and this what this is a broader question, and it's what have you seen to be the biggest breakthroughs in mental health treatments recently? Yeah, biggest breakthroughs. I mean, I think um, I'm a psychologist, so obviously the first thing that would jump into mind would be some of our therapy approaches. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we've seen great strides with cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. and really being able to address depression and anxiety. Um, also dialectical behavior therapy, which mm -hmm. is a therapy that's particularly helpful for people who are struggling with suicide or self-harm. Um, we've done some recent studies adapting that to adolescents, and it looks right. like that's helpful there too. So um, I think we've learned a lot of really great ways to teach people 
more coping skills and to help them sort of improve in that way. Um, I think we do have a ways to go though with refining sort of the best treatments for people. And that's something we're doing here at the center too actually. We have a, I always call it the sister study to RAD, is um, called B2K. And this is a study where we are following people for 10 years who have a mood disorder, so mm -hmm. either depression or bipolar disorder. And we're really trying to understand if there's different subtypes mm -hmm. of illness, and then if there's associated treatments that go with those subtypes. Because right now we kind of have a one-size-fits-all approach to right. starting depression treatment. Typically if people, especially adolescents, if they have moderate to severe depression, mm -hmm. they start an antidepressant and they start a therapy. Um, but all kids may not need both of those things, or maybe certain kids need that out of the gate, while other ones could start with just one or the other. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's particular kinds of medicine that are most helpful for certain subtypes of depression or bipolar. So these are things we're trying to work on, and I think that's the direction we need to go now, is more personalized medicine um, that's done in a measurement-based fashion, so that we're measuring along the way how these different treatments are impacting people. Fascinating. So we've yeah. got time for, I think, two more questions, and we've already got one here. And this one is, We've talked about this a little bit, but what are some common small ways to build up your resilience? Yeah, common small ways. Um, I would say one is just plain old self-care. Everybody always okay. hates that answer, but you know, making sure you make time to sleep, mm -hmm. um, eat things that are good for you, um, you know, exercise, move your body around. Um, we just know that people are less prone to sort of high spikes in emotional experience if they're taking good care of themselves. So I would say that's the number one small step. Number two, I would say, um, really having a way that you check in on yourself. You check in on your mood every day and how you're doing. That sort of self-awareness piece is mm -hmm. just so fundamental in stress management and emotion regulation mm -hmm. and coping. So um, having a way that you check in with yourself once a day. Um, and then I would say having some sort of a relaxation or mindfulness practice. So having a way that you kind of bring your attention and hone it back into yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times that's just focusing on your breathing and kind of taking that space to do that. There's a lot of great resources out there about this. Um, the other thing I would direct you guys to, uh, the American Psychological Association, APA, has a really great website called The Road to Resilience. Maybe we can put the link into the, the feed yeah, somehow. But, um, but it's a great help center website developed by APA that has some just really straightforward tips for That's addressing you know. resilience. Um, things like having a good relationship with your friends and family and taking mm -hmm. time for that. Um, developing realistic goals and some mm -hmm. examples for how you can do that. Um, reflecting upon stressors when they do happen and sort of avoiding going to everything being a crisis mode, but learning yeah. to notice kind of differences in stress mm -hmm. and how some might be a crisis, but some might be kind of daily hassles. Right. And learning to kind of manage your emotion to sort of fit the intensity of the stressor. So gotcha. um, I point you guys to that for some more helpful information about building resilience. Great, sounds great. So we've got this last question here, and this is from Heather. and um, her question is, for those who might be more inclined to lean on like mobile apps okay. and other things like that, such as the website you just mentioned, are there any apps available to foster resiliency? Yeah. We're actually working on one. I love all these oh, questions. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So um, we right now are working on a prototype of a resilience building app that's okay. going to be for adolescents. Okay. And um, we'll have some of the components we talked about, like um, mood management and how to deal with stress and focusing on relationships and responding to bullying and cyberbullying and um, some of that healthy lifestyle information. Mm -hmm. I would say right now there's a lot of mental health apps out there in the marketplace. Um, very few actually have research behind them. So that, that's one thing we're trying to do is actually research whether or not this app is effective. Um, one simple one I would point you guys to is called the Calm app, C-A-L-M. Um, it's available through all of the different app stores and um, it's just a good one to help you with do some breathing exercises, that sort of mindfulness practice that we talked about. Mm -hmm. That's a really good and easy app for that. Um, there's a couple of other ones out there. You can find them, things like Headspace, Breathe to Relax. Um, again, these I found to be useful, and I know when I've worked with some of my teen patients, they've said that they enjoy using these. Um, but again, there's not a lot of great data behind them. So over time, I, I know those areas, they're doing some research there too, but that was one reason we decided to step into the marketplace and develop something for resilience in teens, because it was a need that we saw. So what's the timeline for that? So we have got the content developed and we're just working to get our prototype and get some feedback on it. So hopefully we'll be rolling that out with some of our partnering schools and some of the people that are part of our RAD and D2K studies in the next year. And then we'll go from there. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, we 
we are all out of time for the day. All right. Yeah, this was you did. It did. <laughs> this was a great conversation. I want to thank you very much for joining us. And I want to thank everybody for all of the great questions. Yeah. You know, this, um, this chat will be available here on Facebook. So if you have friends that weren't able to watch it, they can come back and watch it later. We'll also post it on our YouTube channel this afternoon. And if you're not already following the center on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, I would encourage you to do that. They push out great content on a daily basis about resilience yeah. and about wellness and all those things that we talked about today. So again, thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.